This presentation is on pediatric elbow and shoulder injuries. My name is Mary Lloyd Ireland. I'm an orthopedic surgeon practicing at the University of Kentucky. This is my website that does have this and other narrated videos and PDFs of presentations that I've done as well as publications. We also have a YouTube account at the University of Kentucky that has this and other sports medicine related video presentations. The participation in organized sports is great. It is really good to be active and be involved in Little League or other organized sports, but the concern is that these young athletes are being injured with great frequency in overuse, overtraining. In a study now 16 years old, Hogan estimated that 30 million adolescents and pre adolescents participate in sports. The Little League, eight years ago, had 2.2 million baseball participants. 366,000 softball participants, and a total of 2.6 Little League participants. USA Baseball estimates 9 million participants age 9 to 17. That's a lot of children and adolescents, and we need to protect their young shoulders and elbows from injury, particularly overuse injuries. With all these children participating, they're getting hurt. 3.5 million children less than age 12 were tweeted for sports injuries. 50% of these injuries are overuse. There's an epidemic in youth sports in the elbow in pitchers. What about the injury risks? Again, this same study, Hogan from 2003, Almost 12,000 athletes, ages 5 to 17. Injuries annually, 4.3 million. Serious injuries, 1.3 million. Sports injuries, 36% of all injuries for this age group. These surveys included playground equipment, skateboards, and all comers. In a survey for two playing seasons, community organized out of Pittsburgh, the injury rates per thousand athlete exposures, the highest sport was soccer, 2.1, followed by baseball, 1.7, football, 1.5, and softball. Pretty amazing that football is number three in injury rates and soccer leads all injury rates. There are unique properties of the growing skeleton. The periosteum is thicker, the cartilage is thicker and more vascular. This is a displaced both bone forearm fracture that fortunately if we reduce this, maybe not completely anatomically, but since the deformity is in the plane of the movement of the elbow, this would be a volarly angulated both bone forearm even if we don't get it perfect, since that deformity is in the plane of flexion extension, it should remodel completely. The wonders of youth. Fracture healing has three stages, the inflammatory phase, the reparative phase, and the remodeling phase. The intensity of the response is shown here. The remodeling phase is 70% and the inflammation phase is only 10% of the time. Remodeling depends on the amount of growth remaining. Obviously the patient age, bone physis involved, location in the bone, more proximity to the physis, the more remodeling will occur. 
and the deformity in the plane of motion, these are ones that we'll remodel. So if there's a volar dorsal angulation of a both bone forearm fracture, that will remodel much better than a translation in a frontal or AP plane. The bottom is a proximal humerus Salter Harris type 3 that goes ahead and completely remodels. We can allow for or we can accept deformity of the proximal humerus without problems with length or malunion. Both bone forearm fractures, limits of acceptable reduction, still need some definition, particularly in the older adolescent. Sometimes these have to be fixed. Functional complaints are rare. You can see here this one was actually fixed with intramedullary K wires. This was the fracture and this was fixed. This is what the both bone forearm fracture looks like. This is a Salter Harris type 2 distal radius fracture. That's what the deformity looks like. A hematoma block was done on this individual. Reduction was done. He was hung up in Chinese finger traps and then a splint was applied, sugar tongue. He looks a little concerned about what's getting ready to happen to him, but traction here, finger tongs here, and then a reduction was done and he did fine. Displaced fractures, if you see them in the field, splint them as they lie. You can apply axial traction. I don't think that does harm. Put the axial traction on as the assistant is applying a splint. So splint them as they lie in the field and then get x-rays. Stress fractures, the exact incidents are unknown in adolescents. A registry for children and adolescents competing in sports needs to be established. This study, now 10 years old, stress fractures in adolescent competitive athletes with open physes. There were 21 athletes. Seven of these athletes who had stress fractures did not have satisfactory outcome. These were four tibial diaphyseal fractures and six athletes with bursts of speed. Early and thorough investigation is important, making sure there's no underlying bone problem. Diagnosis typically was x-rays and MRI scan. One surgery was necessary for an olecranon stress fracture. What imaging studies do we do in these immature athletes? Typically, plain films. Sometimes a comparison view is helpful to see what the status of the growth plate. Is there any asymmetry in the appearance of secondary ossification centers or apophyses? Can get stress views. MRI scan, CT scan with 3D reconstruction, bone scan are indicated in some situations, but initial plain films are done initially. Comparison cone views of the suspected area are also helpful. There are unique aspects in the skeletally immature. The growth plate, the first line of failures due to stress or falls goes through the epiphyseal plate. You can have abnormal growth, rotational adaptation. You have the physis, the epiphysis, and the apophysis. The apophysis literally means an offshoot. Articular cartilage. When it's developing, there can be a mismatch of how thick and resilient the articular cartilage is, such as an osteochondritis dissecans of the capitellum. Radial head is harder, so that hard radial head pushes on the softer capitellum. Repetitive compression forces resulting in OCD in the gymnast. The appearance and closure of secondary ossification centers in the upper extremity should be understood. It's nice when you have a comparison view that is kind of that textbook view of where that child is at the time. This is an example of the appearance and closure of the growth plates about the clavicle 
and scapula. The last growth plate to fuse is the medial clavicle at age 25. So knowledge of where these epiphyseal plates, ossification centers are, is very important to assess if this is normal development or is this a fracture. Appearance and closure of secondary ossification centers of the humerus. Forearm and hand are shown. So it is helpful to get a comparison view to make sure that those ossification centers, epiphyseal plates, look symmetrical. When we look at contributions of individual growth regions to the overall limb length, on the left in this diagram is the percentage of each bone. Of the humerus, 80% of the growth is proximal, 20% is distal. Of the radius, the distal aspect provides 80% of the growth, whereas the proximal aspect at the elbow provides 20% of the growth. So the vast majority of growth of the upper extremity come from the proximal humerus and the distal radius. If you look at the percentage of the entire extremity, 40% is from the proximal humerus, 40% from the distal radius, and only 20% about the elbow as far as the length of the entire extremity. So which is safer? Organized sports or free play? Unfortunately, I think the answer is free play is safer. Adults or obsolete children? Dr. Seuss. This adolescent is invincible. He's a skateboarder. He broke one forearm. I told him not to skateboard. By the time I got back from a vacation, he had broken the other one, skateboarding. We must protect these young athletes from themselves, or at least try. <laughs>